Welcome and happy Earth Day, everyone. I'm Dave Arscott, Executive Director at Stroudwater Research Center, and it's my pleasure to welcome you all to today's webinar uh, sponsored by PICO, Exelon Company, for us to celebrate the 50th anniversary of Earth Day with a streaming perspective. like to remind you to, that the chat window is open and you are uh, able to share your thoughts on the chat window. Please share where your location is. During the webinar, if you have questions, please use the Q&A function and several of the panelists will be monitoring the questions and collect those or after Dr. John Jackson has completed his uh, presentation. So we'll have five minutes at the end uh, to answer your questions. Once again, thank you for PICO. Uh, thank you to PICO for sponsoring uh, this webinar today. And now uh, I'd like to introduce Dr. John Jackson. Uh, John, why don't you share your video? Uh, John is a senior research scientist at the Stroud Water Research Center. He's an aquatic entomologist and stream ecologist, wears many different hats at the Stroud Center. His uh, expertises are many. He has been focused recently on uh, many issues related to temperature in streams and aquatic insects, the restoration of our streams, particularly in agricultural and urban landscapes, a stream and water quality monitoring with both uh, aquatic insects and water quality. And uh, most recently, John gave a wonderful webinar that's on our website, a uh, recorded version on our website about salt in our environment. So I encourage you to check that out at a later date. So thank you, John, for doing this for our audience. And I will pass the mic to John. All right, so thank you for that kind introduction, Dave, and thank you all out there in cyber world that have chosen to spend a little time with us on the uh, 50th anniversary of Earth Day. One of the things that I want to do is to make sure you realize that it's really important, and those of you who've heard me speak before know that um, I feel like we don't celebrate our success enough, and so I'm gonna try to help you see ways for you to celebrate our success in terms of, of improving the environment, in this case, over the last 50 years. So in this streaming perspective, I'm going to do an introduction of, of environmental history of the, of the United States with a water bias. I'm going to give you some examples of, of real progress where we have clearly clean water, healthier streams and rivers. I'm going to address the basic question, are we done? Or do we need to do more? And then always an important question on a day like today is the reminder, what else can we do? What can I do today that will help make a difference? So this is our 50th anniversary, 50 years. 1970, April 22nd, 1970, there was a lot going on. I threw up, um, in terms of Earth Day, there was this, these are stamps that were issued in October, not US stamps. Note the price of a first class ticket or a first class stamp was only six cents in 1970, not 55 of today. And it was soil and water and air in cities. It was very broad, but today my examples are gonna be my bias and that's life and water. And so mayflies and crayfish and salamanders are, are are what I'm going to be talking about. And it was a big deal this first Earth Day. Earth Day was the, the brainchild of, of Gordon Nelson, Gorlin, uh, Galen, Gaylord Nelson, excuse me. Uh, this is a picture of him speaking on the first Earth Day in Denver. There were Earth Day celebrations all over the country. And it was about a year in planning. So this all started in 1969. Philadelphia was a, a hotbed for this. They didn't have just an Earth Day. They had the first Earth Week. An entire week in Philadelphia was dedicated to the issue of environmental health, 
It was organized by uh, graduate students at the University of Pennsylvania. The neat thing about it is it was a bipartisan effort. We had Democrats, we had Republicans that were participating. We also had corp corporate sponsors. And even though there was a part of this that was a teach-in and there was a part of this that was a, a protest, it was also very broad. There were a number of noted speakers on the lower left. You can see Ralph Nader was here, Allen Ginsberg, Paul Ehrlich. We also, in, in doing research, and by the way, I wasn't here. Um, <laughs> I don't even remember the first Earth Day. Uh, but friends of the Stroud Center were involved. That would be Ian McCarr, uh, Luna Leopold, both good friends of the Stroud Center and also good friends of Ruth Patrick, who was uh, a scientist at the Academy of Natural Sciences and also the founding scientist for the Stroud Water Research Center. The keynote speaker was Ed Muskie, Senator Ed Muskie. He was the author of the Clean Water Act and he was a sponsor of the Clean, or he was the author of the Clean Air Act and the sponsor of the Clean Water Act. So in overall, somebody totaled this all up. They estimated that 20 million participants in the first Earth Day across the country, 35,000 speakers, 12,000 events. So this went on everywhere. This is Fifth Avenue from the, made the front page of the New York Times the day afterwards. Fifth Avenue was filled with people. Why did it happen? It happened because the public was concerned about air and water pollution. They could see it. They could smell it, they could feel it. It was no longer abstract, it was in their lives. So in, with my water bias, you could see waters and watersheds were no longer natural. You had streams in concrete, you had all sorts of scum and color. You had pipes discharging waste everywhere. These are water examples, the same could be true for air pollution, it was visible. And you could see it as changes in color of the water, whether it was green or brown or yellow or orange or fluorescent colors in some cases. We had issues of whether the water was drinkable or swimmable and you had signs, do not drink, do not swim, just reminders. But one of the most visible aquatic reminders were dead fish. You could find examples of dead fish all over the place and Someone estimated in 1969, 41 million fish in the United States died because of environmental conditions. Last but not least, the Burning River. The Cuyahoga burned on June 22nd, 1969, and certainly that ended up being a rallying point for the environmental movement in the late 60s, early 70s. But these problems, this water pollution wasn't new in 1970. I grabbed here an article from 1892. This is very Philadelphia centric and it's about the Schuylkill River burning. 1892, one person died, two badly burned, vessel damaged, a fire on the Schuylkill because of oil and, and other waste on the, on the, the river. This is a, um, an editorial cartoon from the Philadelphia Inquirer. Again, 1899. If you can't see it at the bottom, it says wash day in Philadelphia, another phase of the water question. 1899 in Philadelphia was discussing why the river water was so dirty that if you used it for laundry, it would make your laundry dirtier than when you started. Last one, 1937. Another cartoon, Philadelphia Record, and it says, water, water everywhere, but not a drop to drink. And this is Philadelphia surrounded by the Schuylkill River and the Delaware River. So clearly, long before 1970, we were dealing with water issues in the Philadelphia region and other regions of the country. But what happened in 1970 and got a lot of things going was some legal changes. And the first one, and really in my opinion, was the biggest one was the NEPA, 19, National Environmental Policy Act in 1970. And what that did, that was signed January 1st, 1970. So before uh, the Clean Water Act, before the Clean Air Act, before the EPA was set up, this set up the framework that started EPA. 
1970, we have the birth of the, uh, the EPA, the Environmental Administrator, providing a free framework for supporting the other environmental laws. <clears throat> Several months later, you pick up the Clean Air Act. A couple years later, the Clean Water Act, Endangered Species Act. The 70s and early 80s, we saw a lot of environmental regulations going on and NEPA provided a framework for both providing solid science and also providing financial support and technical support for the states who were the primary source of engaging on these environmental issues. This gives you an idea of how long for water we've been working on this. So the first Pollution Reduction Act was the Rivers and Harbor Act in 1899. And then almost 50 years later, we had the first Water Pollution Control Act. That was amended then in 56, 61, 65, 66. And the last set of amendments in 1972 became what we knew as the Clean Water Act. But remember, everything before that didn't have a, then a national environmental policy behind it and the Environmental Protection Agency behind it in terms of support. So today we're celebrating 50 years of Earth Day, but we're also celebrating 50 years of EPA. We're supporting 50 years of clean air and the Clean Air Act. A lot of good things were happening. And we're also at the, approaching the 40th, 48th anniversary for the Clean Water Act. So one of the most common questions I ever get whenever I'm speaking to the public is, are current environmental laws protecting our streams and rivers? Are they doing their job? And this is a real simple yes or no question. So when I answer it, I always start with yes. Yes, we, we have good evidence that streams and rivers are much cleaner than they were in 1950 or 60 or 70. Let me give you some examples that you can use if you're ever faced with that question. First one is acid rain. Acid rain was such a hot topic in 1980 and 1990. We were doing a lot of work on it and the public was hearing a lot about it. You don't hear much about it today, and one of the reasons why is, is we greatly reduced the amount of acid rain that we're experiencing. So on the left, I have three maps of the eastern United States where it's a measure of acidity. When, when it's green, it's quite low. When it's orange to red, it's quite high. So in 1985, you have this large area of very acidic precipitation slowly by 95 and then 2008, you can see how that has disappeared. So you wonder why we're not talking about acid rain. It's not because we're ignoring it. It's because we've done a good job and reduced the amount of acid in our precipitation, the acidity of our precipitation. And we see that in the streams. These are water samples from two streams in the Philadelphia region, the Manitani and the North Kill. And we just happened to grab some water samples and and in both cases, between the late 90s and, and uh, early 2000s, we've seen sulfate, the acid, declining in these streams. So less in the precipitation, less in the stream. Here's another good story to tell, and I, I think this is tremendous because of scope and scale. Just like that last one, we were talking about the entire eastern United States. This is about the Delaware River and the Delaware Estuary. A nice study that was done by the Delaware River Basin Commission documented that fish in the Delaware have much better survival and reproduction. We're talking about the endangered Atlantic sturgeon, American shad, striped bass, alewife, and, and white perch. These were major migratory fishes, major economic fishes, major recreational fishes, all of whom were struggling if not eliminated and there was no reproduction occurring in the Delaware back in the 60s. But now they have discovered that they're back and they are successfully reproducing. I put a star over on the map here to just give you an idea. That would be the Ben Franklin Bridge and these data are dealing with all of the estuary from Trenton all the way to um, Cape May. One of the things that support this, we, there are probably a lot of factors that contributed to this improvement for the fish. 
The one that we have data for is dissolved oxygen. So fish need dissolved oxygen. And pollution, various kinds of pollution, can just eat that up to the point that a river or a stream or a lake or a pond can be anoxic. Well, the Delaware River Basin Commission ha is fortunate and they have dissolved oxygen data from the Ben Franklin Bridge dating back to the mid 1960s. And I plotted those data here. So zero would be anoxic and eight would be a lot of dissolved oxygen in July. What you see in this figure is in the 60s and early 70s, dissolved oxygen was at zero or one or two, and that is not high enough to support adult fish, much less young fish. Now we're looking at fives and sixes, and on occasion sevens in July, when dissolved oxygen quite often can be quite low, we're actually seeing five or more times the oxygen that we saw in the 60s, a major improvement, and that's allowing in the, the fish to do better in these, in these uh, in the Delaware. These improvements are one of the reasons why American Rivers recently awarded the Delaware River of the Year for 2020. So on the 50th anniversary of the clean, uh, of the EPA, the 50th anniversary of Earth Day is also the, a nice reward for a stream and river that has improved greatly and that's the Delaware River. Last example, getting closer to the work that I do, that's with aquatic insects. These are data from the Susquehanna River, where collections started in the early 1970s, and these are just the number of species that were collected from three to four sites, where people would go out and collect any and everything they could find, mayflies, stoneflies, caddisflies, and this was the total number. So in the 70s, we were lucky to find 60, 70, maybe 80, species in visiting these sites. Whereas now we're at 140, 150, 160, even up to 170. More than twice as many species are found in these sites than were found in the early 1970s. Another real positive success story. So we have biological data, we have chemical data that say that our water and our waterways are healthier than they were before the, the uh, first Earth Day. So that's reason to celebrate, and we should. And we're lucky enough to have data to illustrate these issues. It's really great news, news that often, I would guess many of you don't even know about. Well, you're not alone. Most Americans are too young to remember what streams and rivers were like in 1950 or 60 or 70, so it's really hard to celebrate and we need to help them remember and that's where data plays a role. I always say if I had more data from 1950, my perspective of today would probably be much rosier because I would know how bad it was. Unfortunately, we don't have those data. But we do have a lot of modern data and those data are one of the reasons why if we go back to my original question, our current environmental laws protecting our streams and rivers, I could answer that question no, because there's good evidence that many streams are still polluted and they're not improving right now. Here's a, an example. Again, we'll go to aquatic insect data, macroinvertebrates, the large invertebrates. This is a score that goes from zero to 20 and 20 would be a great stream and zero would be a really, really horrible stream. These are data for over 100 sites, and, and I've just arranged them in good to fair to poor, and about a quarter are good, and about a quarter are poor, and about 50% are in the fair category. Well, if the Clean Water Act was 100% successful, then all of these sites, after 48 years, would in theory be up here somewhere in the good category, up where this blue dotted line is. And obviously they're not. So as much as we've improved things, we haven't completely restored our streams at this point in time. So how do we get a better world? How do we get a cleaner world? How do we get more clean water? Well, these are my three suggestions and they're just suggestions, but they're things that I think can touch you and your life every day. One involves litter, the second involves your chemical footprint, 
And third involves your volunteering, your skills. So the first one, don't litter, don't, and help by picking up litter that you do see. This is really unappreciated, I think. And the reason why is, is I don't think people realize the message of litter. And the message of litter, whether it's on land or in a gutter or in the stream, is we don't care. That we don't care about the environment, we don't care how it looks or what its condition is. It also sends a message when people see litter is that the water is dangerous or it's dirty or it's unhealthy. That may not be true and in many cases it's not. The plastic that's washing in doesn't mean that if you were in that waterway, you would get sick. Finally, litter is just the tip of the iceberg when we talk about pollution. And it, the neat thing about it, if you think about it in those terms, is it's the pollution we can see today. We don't turn rivers fluorescent green anymore, but we do see litter. So it's a really good point to start with the public. But if we ignore that point, then how do we engage the public for all the pollution that we don't see? And that's the chemical pollution that's invisible now at this point. So that gets me to my second point, and that's reducing our chemical footprint. We live in a chemical world, far more than our parents and grandparents did. This would be a, 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 an illustration, for example, of all the chemicals you might find in your garage. And a vast majority of these were not available in 1950 or 1940 or 1930. And our waterways, as stressed as they may have been in those days, weren't stressed by many of these chemicals. It was something else. So I'd like to suggest that where possible, we use caution when using or disposing of these chemicals. And that goes in on inside the house, whether it's in your bathroom or your kitchen or your garage. It also goes on for outside of the house, whether it's your lawn or your trees or your driveway. You need to remember that all of these chemicals eventually make it to our waterways. And then we're asking these waterways to absorb a lot of things that the truth is, is we haven't even thought about what it, its impact might be. Last thing is about sharing your time and your skills and your values. This is really important because this is, uh, every bit of pollution is a people problem. People make it and people can fix it. So these are opportunities to join your local watershed group. You can join a, a, a municipal environmental committee maybe work with your local planning commission. But at a season, you don't need to be an expert. But what you do need to do is ask hard questions. Are we going to get more clean water? Is this going to fix some of our problems? Not just keep it the same, but make it better. Think to the future, not to your world today and tomorrow, but think about it 10 years from now and 20 years from now. When decisions are made, how are they made and how are they working? So to summarize, the Clean Water Act and all our other environmental laws have worked. We see cleaner air, we see cleaner water, significantly cleaner. Biology tell us that's true, chemistry tell it's true. Even though that is good and that's a real important point and we have good reason to celebrate, we still have more to do. Many of our streams and rivers are still polluted and in many cases, they're polluted by things that we didn't pay attention to in 1970. And that gets to the last point, and that is, is that just as in 1970, a cleaner future is possible. It's all about choices and actions. As I said before, pollution is caused by people, and solving that problem is also up to people. So thank you for your time today. Happy Earth Day. Don't forget to celebrate because we've had big successes. So with that, I think Dave is going to moderate some questions. Yeah, thank you, John. That was uh, very informative. Please visit our website or any of our other social media uh, platforms if you'd like to follow us and hear more about our work. In the middle of your screen is a link to our events page where we post uh, future or upcoming events. Check there for more. 
We do have a number of questions, John. We have uh, about five minutes. We may not be able to get to all of the questions, uh, but I think a uh, fun one to start off with comes from uh, Christine Herzer. What's your most unique or coolest animal creature that you have at Stroud, or perhaps that uh, we, we study or interact with, John? Oh, that's a hard one. I mean, we, for example, we have 150 um, easily identified species of, of aquatic insects in White Clay Creek, and, and even the rare ones would push us up to 300. One of the animals I showed in, in an earlier slide is this mayfly that only occurs in the Susquehanna River, and it's kind of neon green and yellow, and um, it's one of my favorites. The second one is actually from our work in Costa Rica. And this thing is, is kind of yellow and orange as an adult caddis fly, and there's nothing like it in the temperate zone. So both of them are, are gems in my opinion. Great, hey, there was a question related to the sulfur story that you shared, uh, particularly with some of uh, the AMD acid mine drainage streams that are still out there. Um, and, and the question came from somebody in Pennsylvania, I think that's aware of those. So maybe uh, just a comment or two, uh, comparing and contrasting the two issues. So that sulfur data that I showed you were from two streams that had no old cold mining in them. They were, they were farming streams, uh, primarily, small villages and farms. The, the amount of sulfur that's in a stream that's, that's severely impacted by, by acid rain is much, much higher, or not acid rain, by um, abandoned mine drainage, acid mine drainage is much higher. And, and between that and the heavy metals, in those cases where you can see the stream or river is, is literally orange, they're still struggling. And, but even on that front, we have made great progress, especially in the last 20 years at trying to remediate aspects of that. And it hasn't been completely solved, but another success story in the upper Schuylkill, for example, where for years there were no brook trout, the brook trout have moved back in and there's an active recreational fishery for brook trout in an area that for generations, uh, nobody saw them. Yeah, good. All right, another one, uh, maybe thinking a little bit further out into the future, but I believe uh, there are those of us that recognize climate change is impacting us now, but how might climate change impact water quality and biodiversity in our streams in the future? Well, that, that's a two-pronged question. It, it will, without a doubt, change our streams. It will change their temperature and it will change their uh, hydrology, the amount of water, and when it arrives and how it arrives. So we might have bigger floods, we might have uh, more severe droughts. The, uh, when you do, especially droughts, that means your dilution capacity goes down and that means the concentration of your pollutants may go up. So there's a number of ways that, that climate change in terms of temperature and precipitation are going to impact the streams. But one of the things I always like to remind people is our streams are already stressed. These streams will handle climate change better if we can clean them up more now. And that's what we're trying to do. In other words, if we can reduce the pollution load, if we can restore the riparian buffer so that they're better shaded and they're not heating up right now, then maybe they can absorb some of the heat that's associated with global warming as just an example. Yeah, and I, th I think uh, maybe also notable is that uh, changes due to uh, climate aren't gonna be the same across the globe. So there'll be some differences from the arid Southwest to the, to the Northeast here. Well, uh, one other thing on that front is we're, uh, we're still building infrastructure to handle storm events. These are your storm drains and your pipes and your infiltration basins. And all of those today need to be designed with the idea of a different future. And when we're retrofitting, ret retrofitting those, we also need to use that as an opportunity to recognize that, that, for example, in this region, 
we may get bigger storm events. We may get a storm events that, that more frequently dump four to six inches of rain. And something that was built in 1970 or 80 or even earlier may not be designed to handle that capacity. And we need to think about that today. All right, one more question and we're just about out of time. Uh, this one is uh, maybe a couple combined together. One question was, you know, do you have any advice about proper chemical uh, disposal? And combined with another one about um, a question about how impactful or harmful are pesticides that are applied on lawns, residential, and you know, urban uh, lawns. Um, so let's start with the first one: proper disposal. There is every municipality, every state that I'm aware of, at least, has um, a hazardous waste disposal program. It may be once a year, it may be multiple times of the year, where if, if you go and if you don't see it on their website, you ask the question and they'll tell you and they will ask you to bring it there. They don't want you pouring it down the sink. They don't want you pouring it down the toilet. That's also true for all of your pharmaceuticals. They don't want those going down the sink. They want you to dispose of those properly. And in many pharmacies, you'll see now um, that they will accept your old drugs, your old, your old prescriptions, so that they're properly disposed of. Or and the police departments uh, will also recover those materials. Different communities have different approaches, but there's definitely ways of doing it. And, and they're very different than what we, we used to do. And we used to recommend the what we thought was safe, for example, flushing it down the toilet was about keeping it out of the hands of children, not about what it did do to the stream uh, or the downstream consumption of that water. In terms of lawn care and lawn care products, that's a challenge. There's so many different things that are going on, uh, but it's just like everything else. And, and I think uh, I, my suggestion is always moderation, moderation, moderation. The, um, I can't tell you for sure that do this and it works and do, or don't do that. And um, that the science there is, is not resolved, but we do know that these things were invented to have an impact on invertebrates, for example, and that's gonna be true whether they're in, in, um, in the stream or in, in your lawn or on your, your tree. The second thing is it's vitally important that if you do have someone using them, that they follow the rules. In other words, if they're fertilizing, they're not fertilizing when it's going to rain or fertilizing when it's raining. If they're applying an insecticide, they're not doing it when it's raining or they're not doing it when it's supposed to rain. Following the instructions, the regulations tied to these chemicals are vitally important. Otherwise, if it's, and we've all seen it, it ends up running off the lawn into the gutter. And where does the gutter lead? Directly to the stream. Yeah, all good points. Well, I would like to thank John for sharing his thoughts with us and uh, once again, happy Earth Day to all. Thank you for taking time out of your day and joining us. And please consider volunteering for an organization, both for the environment and to help out our communities. And we wish you all uh, safe, safety and health in these very unique and uh, different times. So thank you all for joining and have a wonderful Earth Day. Thank you.